And that song gears you up and you know that it's time to have some fun because it's Ring Respect Radio time. We might have taken one week off, but that's okay. We're back with you. Not so much in a live aspect, but Papa Spokes, we're going to be recording this one and bringing this in a pre-recorded aspect. That's what we used to do with Ring Respect. So we're getting back to our roots, uh, making a little bit away on Thursday nights because it's a packed house on Thursdays where we do the MLW coverage for Fusion. And we are followed up by our good friends, Astrid and Cody, on making an impact. So here we are officially on Fridays like we were back on the Video Bros Network as well. But now we're Video Bros Network. We're on our local establishment. Both those channels rocking Ring Respect Radio. I'm Bobby Munson. That's the man with the angelic voice, Papa Smokes. Papa Smokes, let the good people know how you're feeling today. Well, Munson, thanks for the awesome introduction. And I'm feeling great tonight. And I'm wondering how all my wrestling people are doing out there. Let us know in the comment section, how are you doing? And by the way, whether you're on YouTube or you're on Twitch, throw us a follow, a like, a sub, whatever you can do to share the love because we appreciate it and every little bit helps on our local establishment. We are hoping to make affiliate by this weekend. Hopefully we have done that already and we're going to be able to rock that affiliate mode for you guys so that we can bring you all sorts of great phenomenal content and we're also trying to boost those subscriptions as well too so whether you're checking us out on our local establishment on youtube or on ring respect radio uh the video bros network uh then just go ahead and do everything you can to spread the word get it out there because man those subs are going up like crazy pop spoke the viewed hours are going up like crazy this has been the biggest push in the six years that you and i have been doing this that i have seen our content get and needless to say I am more excited now than I was when I was just kind of a, a ridiculous, you know, chubby 350 pound guy getting first started into this thing. <laughs> You're so hard on yourself, Munson, but no, isn't it a great feeling to be making some progress? And we had some lean years there when we were just first getting going and all that. But now we've got some fans, we've got some supporters and friends that, that check us out and watch our stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm also very thankful for this to anyone who's watching this and, uh, and enjoying our content. Thanks, peace, and cheers out to you. And uh, come back. We're going to keep going. We're, we're all about the grind, so we're going to have lots more uh, content for you in the future. Yeah, you bet we will. And a big thank you to all the people who have taken the time to be on shows with us. Uh, some of the creators here on our local establishment who have shared the screen with us, Papa Spokes, but also... All the great interviews we've had, I mean, outside of PPW, Cutthroat, Cout, and Callie joining us on the first edition of the Bro Show, which was a massive success. But we have had, in recent times, Mr. Thomas and Alex Kane, both of the Bomae Fight Club. Lance and Hawaii joined us for a great interview as well, too. I mean, these interviews keep pouring in, and there are more to come, Papa Smokes. I'm constantly digging deep, trying to find them, and we're going to get some names on here. I know that we've been told the boys are going to get get our name around there in MLW, and hopefully that's the case. We'll start reaching out to some even bigger names and hopefully be able to bring you the best content on Thursday nights and have a lot of stuff that we could talk about on Fridays. Especially on Fridays, we're going we're gonna to kick it a little retro or at least pick a topic that's trending and kind of talk about the history behind that. And that's kind of where we're going with today's episode, Papa Spokes. We saw on Monday, if anybody was online, that somebody, I, I feared the reason that they were trending at this point, because we're not talking about a very young man, but somebody that I've really enjoyed the career of was trending. Good thing it was just to talk about when he was with the WWF in the 90s and some of those kind of things. I'm talking about Bob Backlund. And man, at his age, I really was fearing that I was opening that up and this was going to be a completely different homage here today. Yeah, it's it's a thrill to uh, do one of these uh, career talks here when the guy hasn't just died. This is nice. Uh, I'm not even sure Bob Backlund could die. You know, he's a tough guy and he stays in such good shape. I, I mean, obviously everybody does someday, but uh, I could see Backlund making it a long, long time. Yeah, me too. Can you imagine, like, we talked about Judo Gene uh, recently on the program. Can you yeah. Judo Gene locking horns with Bob Backlund? I mean, that's that's just oh. two guys that just don't know how to how to say, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a real clash of the Titans right there, too. And uh, I think Backlund might have been a more sportsman-like competitor than uh, Gene LaBelle was. Uh, Le Probably Backlund would go to lock up with him and LaBelle would thumb him in the eye or something. <laughs> I imagine that would be the case. Uh, but yes, uh, he was uh, 
the born in 1949. I was born uh, Robert Lewis uh, Backlund. So again, Bob Backlund, his official name, no gimmicks, nothing about that from uh, Mr. Bob Backlund. And I, I would say even like, despite the fact that a little bit of the entertaining side when it came to the 90s, it was just a, it was a switch definitely from what he used to be. But still, he was ultimately Bob Backlund. He always has been Bob Backlund. There isn't a lot of gimmick to the whole thing. He is just a tough son of a bitch that can stretch you every which way you can possibly think of. Yeah, that's totally true. And if you're talking about his 90s run, he really, uh, he he's kind of a wild guy anyways. This is what I hear. I have not met the man, unfortunately, but uh, he's a loud guy and he, uh, he, he insists when kids ask him for autographs, he always has that they makes them do push-ups or exercises or name the presidents and stuff like that all the presidents in order you have to earn your stuff with backland and uh he, he's a tough uh, he's a tough guy and uh i think they just like kind of amped up his his outward bizarre uh kind of eccentric personality in the in the 90s got him to act the heel part and uh i, I think by this time backland had kind of accepted that the business had changed a whole bunch since he was in it it was changing when he was WWF champion, but I don't think he was open to that change at that time. And then by this time in the nineties, he realized uh, it, it had changed and he was just going along with it. And we will talk more about that nineties run here in a little bit, but we want to kind of get to the heart of how that even came about. I mean, people might know him for that nineties run or to a lesser extent might know him for his short run as the manager of uh, one Darren young, as he was trying to make Darren young great again. Although, Albeit, I don't know that Darren Young ever was great in the confines of WWE. I think more it was uh, make Darren Young good for the first time. Uh, but uh, I was and, looking forward to seeing a lot more out of that, definitely, than what we got out of it. And it, it didn't really ultimately work anyway. Hey? But uh, another funny little run for Backland. Yeah, really was. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get to the heart of the matter and let's start with his training. Trained by Eddie Sharkey, and I know, Papa folks, you've got a lot you could probably tell, or at least some history that goes behind Eddie Sharkey and the people he trained. Yeah, I know who he is for sure. He was kind of a smaller time wrestler from Minnesota, which is also where Backland is from, and uh, he did some time with Vern Gagne in the AWA and all that, but was uh, never really a name performer. But the what Eddie Sharkey is best known for is for uh, being going on uh, national TV on the 2020 special, the same one where David Schultz slapped that John Stossel a couple times in the face. That same show, Stossel sits down with Sharkey and Sharkey outs the business at a time where people weren't doing that at all, including blading himself with a razor blade on the TV show, just to show how it's done, you know, he went that far into it and even shows uh, Stossel how to take some bumps in the ring and everything. So anyway, without getting into that too much, that's what Sharky is best remembered for now. He was never really much of a wrestler, but uh, he got the wrestlers pretty pissed off by that TV show. Yeah, he sure did. Uh, but let's uh, let's go back to the focus of one of his greatest students of all time, yeah. Uh, yeah. and Bob Backlund, uh, making his debut uh, in 1973. And Bob Smokes, he worked for the AWA when he first uh, started out. And I'm sure you can yeah. tell a whole schwack of stories with regards to the AWA and definitely Bob Backlund's tenure there. Yeah, well, this was in Backlund's early days. I'm um, talking about Eddie Sharkey training him. Sharkey would have just been showing him getting him smart to the pro wrestling business. Uh, Backlund, of course, already a, a celebrated amateur wrestling star in a state full of amateur wrestling stars. So that couldn't have been uh, any easy journey. But, um, yeah, he was a college athlete, decorated and all that stuff. And then uh, he was one of those guys, I'm going to get into the pro wrestling business. So now you have to kind of unlearn some of the wrestling skills that you've been working on all this time because you can't wrestle like that in a pro match or in a worked match or whatever. So Sharky would have come in there teaching him to slow down, teaching him his timing and uh, all the rest of the uh, nuts and bolts of pro wrestling training. 
And then uh, Backlund's AWA run, I don't think there really is that much of, of interest in it at that time. I think this is when he was uh, getting his chops ready, uh, going on the road, doing house shows, doing spot shows, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think he ever uh, had any titles or anything like that in AWA. He would have just been uh, kind of a developmental talent at that time. And uh, uh, later branching out, of course, we'll talk about into the NWA and uh, getting starting to really learn the game there. But, yeah, just, just like uh, a lot of the uh, um, wrestlers we've talked about on this podcast before, including Danny Hodge and... Uh, and uh, Kurt Angle and uh, even a, like a Brian Danielson, guys that were uh, exceptional amateur Greco-Roman wrestlers that came into the pro wrestling biz and found success because they were already skilled grapplers and good athletes. Yeah, you bet they were. So, uh, But you are right. Uh, it wasn't a very long, memorable run that anybody remembers for because shortly after he worked with uh, the AWA, there was his time that he started uh, meeting up with uh, Tori and uh, Terry Funk and working with the Funks there. Yeah, and wouldn't that be an education for any wrestler? Because, <laughs> again, the Funks, we mostly, a lot of people remember them as, as the wild brawlers, especially Terry, but... Uh, those guys were scientific wrestlers when they first started, just like Dory Funk Sr. had been uh, the same kind of thing. He was, a, he was a college wrestler, skilled, did the first part of his pro wrestling career as the kind of baby face wrestler that didn't need any tricks, could just out-wrestle any opponent, and then kind of turn into like a brass knuckles brawler after a while. Same thing uh, that his boys did, and... Uh, uh, that the time that we're talking about in the seventies with uh, Backland, they were probably still more on that scientific wrestling style. So they that would have been a match made in heaven right there. They they could have taught him uh, all their stuff, and Backland would have picked it up quickly and easily, probably. And then uh, yeah, from there, and then he uh, after working with them, it was about a year later that he went over to another company. I know that you uh, used to watch and grew up on uh, Georgia championship wrestling, working with the Briscoes. Yeah. Yeah. See, and again, there's, there's that, uh, another matchup, the same thing that Jack and Jerry Briscoe from uh, Florida and just such uh, intensely excellent uh, uh, amateur wrestlers, the, especially Jack, I think. And, and, uh, Jack was another one of those guys that, that kind of had the Kurt Angle type thing going on. Uh, just you'll never beat him because you can't out-wrestle him sort of thing. That's his only gimmick. And he was NWA champion for a while too, very respected. Also because he could stretch anybody he got in the ring with too. Nobody screwed around with him. But uh, uh, same thing with uh, Backlund. They, they probably all had their eyes on him as a... Uh, as a promotional tool, as a, as a, like as they like to call them, a white meat baby face, just an all American boy that uh, is is a goody two shoes, uh, very fit, great at wrestling, and has a positive outlook, and and will be popular amongst the children that come to wrestling. Perfect, right? Like, doesn't every wrestling federation want or need a character like that? So, oh, yeah. Backland always had work everywhere he went, and. It's not the same nowadays, but um, in those days, that was one of the real baby face archetypes was just, you didn't have to be cool. You didn't have to be good looking or any of that stuff. You could just be a really good wrestler and the fans would get behind you. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the fans, a lot of the modern day fans are definitely going to know about his run within the uh, time with the McMahon family maybe not so much his initial run though back in 1976 he joined up with Vince McMahon senior in what was known as the worldwide wrestling federation the WWWF where he ended up going on to become the champion for what I believe is recorded as a five-year run because again we talked about this on our tribute to Tony Inoki that there was the debacle about the possible loss of that on the New Japan show out in Japan there, and that the WWF, or WWE as they're now known, do not recognize Antonio Inoki ever as having defeated Bob Backlund as the champion, and it seems like uh, Bob Backlund will forever have that run under his belt at uh, the five-year mark. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing of, of life before the internet, too, was that if this match was not on the Japanese TV, then only really the people in the arena saw it. And eventually the tapes will come out and stuff, but only the most hardcore fans would be from North America would be ordering tapes from Japan. You know, probably Dave Meltzer, uh, Jim Cornette, and Weasel Dooley would be about the only people ordering those tapes at that time. And uh, but uh, so you could do stuff like that. You could make a match that where the championship change hands and then just pretend it never happened. It used to happen in the territories all the time. Sometimes just in the town. 40 miles up the road or whatever you and because nobody would know from one town to the next kind of thing or very few people anyway but um yeah as we discussed on the antonio Inoki episode i watched that match again just before that uh, podcast and and it strikes me as chaotic at the end i don't know what you thought of it but um um, Backlund is looking like he's still ready for a fight and he's holding the belt like away from the guys the guys in Inoki's corner who are kind of trying to grab it and stuff and uh, it looks kind of like a tense situation maybe it was part of the work I don't know but to my to my experienced eye it looked like something was going on there and I'm not sure what though yeah, I mean, it. I have gone and watched it back a couple of times now, especially after we had that conversation. And again, yeah. it, it is a very tense moment. And if it is part of the work, I mean, credit to them for every well done. bit of it. Because yeah. I, even at this point, I still believe that there was some legitimate tension within that finish. Yeah, there absolutely was. And uh, that's part of a function of, of the strong style that was getting going there, too. Uh, um, I, I saw a bunch of stuff about Backland on the Twitter last week when it was trending or this past week. And uh, there were some clips of matches of some of his, they look like shoot fights kind of that, you know, it's, it's probably a worked finish at the very least, but you can see a lot of that grappling is, you can see they're fighting against each other. Like it's, it's not cooperative in the least. And then there's a picture of Backland after, I forget his opponent. I want to say Misawa, but anyway, Backlund's uh, in his street clothes at the at the airport leaving, and he's his face like he looks like he's been through a fifteen round boxing match. Like his eyes are swollen shut, and his there's like raspberries like of 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 skin removed off his face, like taking some hard shots and and the big head kicks in those matches absolutely crazy and it's it's neat that backland the ultimate competitor just always uh seeked out that kind of competition against other good fighters and he reveled with that stuff and uh we'll talk about his wwf championship run and everything but when that was done he he went right off to japan like to when he quit wwe just to uh to get some rough and tough real grappling matches under his belt and get that competitive spirit back. And if I'm not mistaken, the match you speak of too is the first time that they ever saw the glimpse of the, maybe the darker side or this psychotic side of Bob Backlund in the form of a promo. I'm not sure if you were able to catch the promo that ensues where he actually mentions the word that, that I, I believe the line in fact goes that I am going to murder the soul of my opponent or murder my opponent like along those lines, he legitimately yeah. snaps. And you see that psychotic side of backlash starting to shine through even so far as back then. Yeah. And that's some of his Japanese promos. I think that might've be where he got that style from. Cause he would speak slowly and clearly, I guess for the translators or something, but he started just yelling like that and, and, it's it's scary he looks crazy in that it's so effective too and i'm sure that's part of what he brought back to uh his later heel run in wwf yeah it really does seem that way i did not know that existed obviously as a kid and we're going to talk about my childhood and uh watching bob backland but uh we'll go back to the WWF and that run there. So this run lasting five years, uh, opponent after opponent, uh, great match after great match, Bob Backlund just uh, killing it over there. But as you said, the tides were turning, wrestling was starting to change, that was starting to be seen. 
And that was the time, and I believe you told the story before Pop Smokes, and I'll let you elaborate a little bit, but Bob Backlund at first was not ready to adapt and change who he was when it came to his run with the WWF. And that initially was the reason for his departure. And he also wasn't interested in being the guy to drop to Hulk Hogan, which led to the match with the Iron Sheik, where he loses the belt finally to the Iron Sheik, who inevitably drops it to Hulk Hogan, kicking off Hulkamania. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is still... uh... Uh, Backlund's title run still being under Vince Senior that that was another big difference uh, in in the company at that time too that might have had some effect on his uh, desire to remain employed there but um, yeah yeah we just briefly we've we've maybe touched on it in in previous episodes but Vince Senior ran the New York territory just in accordance with the five boroughs there he always wanted his champion to appeal to one of the large ethnic groups that lived in New York, such as he had uh, Pedro Morales for the, for the Hispanic crowd. He had um, Bruno Sammartino for the Italians and, uh, and uh, a few others uh, of note. And uh, then it started getting too rough at Madison Square Garden because he, they, some of those guys were getting so much heat that the now the ethnic groups are fighting each other in the crowd and there be it started to get pretty wild there. So I think Vince Sr. wanted to get away from that. Hence, he kind of just took his pure babyface backland and made him champion, set up a whole uh, roster of heels for him to fight. But... Yeah, at the, by the end of this, the company was changing, and with that, the business changing quite a lot. This is in 1982 and three, I guess, and uh, when Vince Jr. starts uh, taking over the company, now he's got a whole different idea of how to do it. It's not going to be the uh, competitive-looking matches anymore. It's not going to be. Um, it's not going to be the the. Uh, different boroughs coming to Madison Square Gardens. It's going to be TV deals. It's going to be cartoons. It's going to be ice cream bars and all that kind of stuff and mass merchandising and branding. So McMahon Jr. didn't see the future in Backland. He had already had a decent run and and, uh, he was going to be done with him and debut Hulk Hogan, who he had who he had uh, snatched up from Vern Gagne's AWA. And uh, yeah, he also had uh, two baby faces there. So he wanted to uh, have the interim champion. Backland had some say in this. And j- just like a, a real shooter will do, he didn't want to drop the belt to anybody but someone that would be believable, right? A real, also accomplished amateur wrestler make it look good. They also did the injury angle where uh, the Iron Sheik had his exercise clubs and was doing those. And uh, then Backland came out and he started swinging them around. So the Sheik works over Backland, hits him in the back with the uh, exercise clubs a couple times. Now Bob's got the taped up midsection coming into the title match. Uh Uh-oh, this is a bad look right here. And, uh, course we know the rest is history cheeky baby uh puts the puts him in the camel clutch the towel is thrown in and the new era of wrestling is of wwe and all of wrestling is going to start with the uh, reign of hulk hogan one week later but as legend has it mcmahon jr in his first meeting with backland said yeah we'll keep you around but you gotta dye your hair black and i'm turning you heel and Backlund said, yeah, I'm out of here. I didn't build all this up to have this happen. Like, the people know me and they like me and and I'm not doing that. So, like I was mentioning before, he took off to Japan and started doing shoot matches with Misawa and, and uh, Takada and all these real tough guys in Japan and just flourishing over there. Had some of his best matches and best footage are from there because... They're not so much pro wrestling matches with uh, storytelling and all that kind of stuff. It's just pretty much guys sparring very violently. Like 
Yeah, it's good stuff. That Inoki match is like that a little bit too. Yeah, almost like it, it almost borderlines on what uh, the UFC used to be like in a sense when you get two really good grapplers in there, two great fighters that just couldn't one-up each other, and they had no time limits back in the day of UFC. So some of these matches of Bob Backlund's, I'm talking – you better sit down and have a good afternoon because they have got some decent length to them, but they look like fights. They feel like fights. And if you like watching two guys throw each other around and beat the living piss out of each other, then Bob back the matches, especially the ones out of Japan are some of the absolute best afternoon watches you can get behind. For sure. And I mean, uh, also his, his matches as a WWF champion are pretty good too, because he had a nice, bunch of heels to work with including superstar graham ivan koloff stan hansen came through bruiser brody came through he had lots of good very experienced heels to work with uh and uh and i also like his matches with jesse ventura good stuff too and uh yeah the uh, vince senior just kept lining them up and uh backland knocking them down uh, and uh uh, everybody knew when Superstar Graham was champion right before Backlund. They all knew who he feared. He was he was avoiding Backlund for so long. They kept kept them apart because they're the they were the uh, diametrically opposite wrestler. Backlund, the the hard worker and the 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 sportsman and the non cheater and everything. And uh, Graham, the absolute opposite of that, the cheater. <laughs> and the superstar and the shades and everything the people loved it and couldn't get enough of it and then uh yeah the, the after uh superstar graham had a almost a year-long reign that's when backland took over and they kept him in that spot for quite a while yeah they sure did and before he uh eventually made his way back to said wwf after his dime away there he did also have some matches in the nwa tor- territories and and also uh, with the champ, uh, Nick Bockwinkle at the time. Uh, so get you to elaborate on that. But also the NWA, he had four matches against Harley Race for the NWA cha- Heavyweight Championship. And also one against Ric Flair as well, too. Never actually uh, defeating any of them in those matches. But again, some very great classics. Yeah, and it was it was a different time, too, when Backlund was champion because Vince Sr. worked with the other promotions. He, he didn't see them as competition he they worked together and they shared talent and uh they uh shared all kinds of uh advice and 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 uh, other business matters and stuff like that is they they had a harmonious relationship so uh at that time there were some of the dream matches as people talk about nowadays backland versus bockwinkle both titles on the line i mean my god how could you do that right they're they're from different federations backland had the did you say it was four matches against race was he champion yeah. for all of them yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, I, it as far as the stat i read i can't confirm but the stat i read uh versus the nwa champion harley race on four occasion and against nwa champion rick flair on a single occasion for sure uh yeah i remember in the wrestling magazines i know one of those matches was against harley race in kansas city and it's an outdoor match and it's raining and they're both really bloody and but the ring is soaked and everything there's some famous pictures of that got to try and find that months and uh, it, it looks funny because uh it, it's actually raining pretty hard during this match and they just keep her going you almost need to get that match playing with uh, Slayer's raining blood in the background. Playing yeah. the time of that. that would just kick some serious ass, I believe, right there. For sure. <laughs> now we're going to talk about uh, going going back to... Well, actually, you know what? Before we talk about the run in the 90s, I also want to mention... Now, uh, you mentioned Pedro Morales, and he actually was tag team champion in the WWF briefly with Pedro Morales. And they defeated the Wild Samoans in order to get there. Yeah, that couldn't have been easy because the Samoans were the... Uh the kings of tag team wrestling for a few years while they were there. But uh, again, uh, Backland and Morales would have been considered quite a dream team at that time and would have been uh, so, so popular with the fans. Uh, I I imagine they were getting some big pops and they got put over the Samoans, but uh, often Sika also held the belts uh, 10 times or something like that. So uh, no big deal to them. 
Yeah, Gold seems to always follow any of the uh, members of the Anawaii or Fatu family. Uh, but yeah. yes, uh, there was uh, Gold that they dropped over to Pedro Morales and Bob Backlund. But uh, going now back to the WWF or WWF as it was under Vince Jr., uh, Bob Backlund making a return. And this is definitely when I was into pro wrestling at this point. Uh, this was 1992, so I had been a fan for approximately three four-ish years kind of thing so i had been in tune with what was going on and suddenly i'm watching i believe it was wwf superstars but i would say yes because 93 was when raw debuted so this is predating the raw times it was back when we had uh, uh superstars which aired here i know wrestling challenge was more uh in the u.s if i'm not mistaken uh, if that's the way it worked i'm not sure um when i was a uh, like in the late 80s it used to be uh WWF superstars on at 10 in the morning on yeah. Saturday or something. That's what I remember. And that's what we got too. But I know that they also had it branded as WWF wrestling challenge in some markets as well too. And, but I know definitely for us out here in Canada, especially Western Canada, we had it as WWF superstars. And even in the nineties, yes, it was on a Saturday at about 10 AM. I remember discovering it because I happened to be sitting there with my brother watching Saturday morning cartoons. And all of a sudden it comes on the TV holy shit, this is, these are real guys. These are big guys on screen beating the piss out of each other. Like, I've been yeah. watching cartoon characters beat the piss out of These are real men. Holy shit, I got I to gotta tune in. And so my brother and I become massive fans. I've told the story a few times before. And then I, all of a sudden, 92 rolls around, and I'm getting really invested in this stuff, really enjoying the run of Bret Hart. I mean, I got invested in it when he won the title here in Saskatoon, a great, joyous moment. All of a sudden, this weird mad tv like guy standing on screen wearing this goofy suit and a bow tie inside the ring and doing a promo and i'm like who the hell is this guy and why should i buy that he's dangerous in any way like he's supposed to be a heel not so sure i buy him as a heel and this is when he introduced showing how to lock a chicken wing onto someone, the chicken wing cross face and as he does it he's got i believe it might have been pellegrini at the time that was the in-ring uh, guy for doing the interviews and stuff like that so i believe todd pellegrini's there and he's got the microphone and bob backland's got him holding the microphone to his face still while he's got this poor uh, enhancement talent guy in the chicken wing cross face and the eyes and the yelling of bob backland the psychoticness comes through it just the, the the evil side of bobby bad bobby when i was a kid just starts <laughs> salivating at this opportunity and it's like well son of a bitch this guy shut me up in a in a new york minute here this is somebody i want to pay attention to and we'll, we'll go more into it but man i i remember it so vividly papa folks that i just i knew right then this guy was going to be something special to watch yeah, I I got to agree with your sentiments about that too. And I know uh, when I watched that segment uh, again, there's no internet or anything. I didn't know it was going to be happening. You, you you could actually be surprised back then. Um, I couldn't believe that Backlund was back with WWF. I mean, uh, you know, years go by and fences get mended and all that stuff, but uh, I still couldn't believe it. And there he was with his haircut and uh, and a heel now too, right? But like we talked about before, he he was uh, he was an old school wrestler. Like Bob has a foot in old wrestling and a foot in modern wrestling too. And and I think it took him a while to come around to how the business had changed. And he got a chance to make another run. And 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 if that's how it was discussed, that you'll get a championship run because Brett doesn't want to drop the belt to anyone else but a an actual shooter kind of thing. Then. Yeah, but uh, who wouldn't jump at that chance, right? Yeah, and that's what they did. They had Bob Backlund go straight to the top as the top heel in the company, did it in a beautiful way. And then I know to this date that still one of our top-ranked videos here on the channel is one of the early editions of Ring Respect Retro that I was testing out, talking about uh, things that I watched as a kid. And one of the things I talked about is the Survivor Series match, the I Quit match between Bob Backlund and Bret Hart. And this one still... Yeah is racking up hundreds of thousands the hundreds to thousands of views per month because people are so invested in that time frame in professional wrestling there's a lot of people that grew up in the era i did uh watching it and they really fondly remember this and that match not only was this a quality match between two absolute shooters in the ring two great professionals i could watch bret hart and bob backland fight for hours these guys were phenomenal but it wasn't just the investment to what was going on in the ring but 
the moment when you saw just how good Owen Hart could be as when he really wanted to pour it on on the outside really added to this match when he is pleading with his own mother like as if he's now broken he is torn he can't watch Brett suffer in the ring anymore at this point and he's crying and doing all this and you see Martha over there and her uh, tears are well enough to the point where <laughs> I don't even know if Martha was in on the whole thing or not because if she is kudos to her and her acting ability but man definitely kudos to Owen with the way he poured that on and just that moment seeing Martha come and take that towel and throw it in and uh call that match and Brett losing as a result of that and Owen screwing Brett in the process I mean it was such a insane moment as a fan i couldn't believe it i was pissed like i mean i was a massive Bret Hart <laughs> fan at the time and this son of a bitch backlin come along and beat brett at the submission game of all things like this did exactly what it was supposed to do the young fan in me had no clue about these guys otherwise like i didn't know about backlin's previous career none of that kind of thing i just knew this guy was some pissed off old man that came in here and just beat my hero and I was none none the happier for it. I was I was angry. I wanted instant revenge for Bret Hart. Yeah, I think most people did. But uh, again, I was watching this for the first time back then too, as it was happening on TV. Not only was I surprised that Bob Backlund of all people was making a comeback in the in the, you, you know twenty five years later in in WWE, but. My God, he's got a title match, and it's kind of looking like he might win this. And yes, he did indeed win the title. I couldn't believe how it was uh, booked. I just, I had no idea. The same thing, it's life before the internet. I didn't know the whole story of what had happened because uh, there weren't uh, sources in which to read all this stuff. Didn't know he was coming back. Didn't know there was anything planned. Now all this stuff is out about everything all the time if you actually want to find it. I don't like to spoil my own surprises very much, so I don't seek out this stuff. But um, at this time, it just came as such a surprise. I said, I can't believe Bob Backlund is champion again, but I like it. And and I thought he was doing good work at the time. And uh, so much different than his previous character, you know, the as uh, Superstar Graham used to call him, Howdy Doody Bob Backlund, because he looks like the little puppet Howdy Doody. And uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, it, was a, it was a changing of the guard. And uh, I had no idea what Vince had planned with his whole reign and everything. And I, I, I have the feeling it didn't go exactly how he planned it. But uh, there we got it. It was a little treat for the old wrestling fans. Yeah, and again, it ended up being a transitional ch championship run, which is very yeah. unfortunate because I think that there was miles to be had in the Bob Backlund heel character. I think that they could have done a lot more with it outside of this Brett feud. I think the Brett feud should have proved enough that you could do more uh, mileage on Bob Backlund as a heel, but instead he ended up being a transitional champion and at a house show within under 10 seconds i believe losing it to diesel kevin nash getting his first wwf championship run at that point and then seemingly bob backland just disappears from wwf altogether uh this would be up until the uh, uh it, later into the uh 2010 era when he came back to the company i uh, had some spots uh joined them for a few different things and then later on just prior to around 2017 was put into the program as the manager of Darren Young with the segments. Let's make Darren Young great again. Uh, people can debate whether or not Darren Young was ever great in WWE, but I, I was okay with the direction that this was supposed to go because I know Bob Backlund. I know what I could see if he could have taught Darren Young to be something special, just like him and everything like that. And having some psychotic old man in your corner like that, that could it help to pull the cheating wins and put Darren Young over? If Vince would have known how to still put guys over at, at that point in time, I, I think they could have had some mileage out of Bob Backlund, the manager, in fact. Yeah, and he was kind of running Young's character like a, like a political campaign kind of thing, wasn't he? And he, he was uh, shouting him out and had the slogans and the and the stickers and everything. And Backlund's a lunatic, and he, he, he's a good talker. And, and obviously they, they wanted Young to get some help from Backlund in, in that manner and to try and get him over because they were worried that he, he wouldn't get himself over kind of thing. So uh, 
I thought it was cool and and uh, involving Backland is just such a weird thing that but they like to bring old guys back sometimes in a comical or a bizarre kind of fashion and uh, just see if it works kind of and uh, that's not even the last uh, appearances he did with uh, WWE too. Uh, he, he has I'm sure you're getting to this but uh, I was pleased as punch to see his ones after this too when he's really in his late sixties or something. Yeah. And it was, uh, and that came about. And then, uh, uh seemingly in 2017, uh, left WWE, uh, semi retired at that point. Uh, but that wouldn't be the last we saw of Bob Backlund, the wrestler, mind you. So here's where it starts to get really interesting. He leaves WWE in 2017 and not that long ago at the age of 68 years old. And we've seen some wrestlers come back recently that are in that age group. And it's been fun to seek this out just yet. But I have a funny feeling that if anybody at 68 years old could still look like they take a good bump, I have a strong belief Bob Backlund is. And in fact, I've seen just prior to that, him taking some bumps in training videos even at the age he was. And he looks absolutely fantastic at that age. If only I could be that good when I'm in my 60s, I'd be very, very blessed. But yes, he did go and work for, I believe, the uh, Tradition Pro uh, is where that he ended up going to wrestle there at the age of 68. Uh, definitely protected in some more tag-like environments and stuff like that, of course, being 68 years old. But again, I, I kind of curious to go and have a look at this because... I do believe that if anybody in that age range could come back and do something, Bob Backlund's definitely one of them. Yeah, he's a wrestler's wrestler. He'll, he'll be a wrestler all his life until he dies, and uh, and that's the kind of guy he is. But I was trying to lead up to, um, I'm not sure what year it was, but I remember watching Raw one night in, must have been 2014 or 15 kind of thing, and they had a, they had a little thing going on where it was a wrestler whose uh, first name was Heath. And he, he had this challenge where he wanted to, uh, Oh yeah, I only fight champions or ex champions. So they were sometimes pissing him off and bringing back old veterans from the past. Do you recall this yeah, little bit yeah. now that I know that was Vader was one. Hey, and, uh, there yeah. were a few other ones, but then all of a sudden backland comes out to the, uh, the real uh, marching band, the collegiate music kind of, and here comes Backlund kind of looking confused out there. The, man, I popped so hard, and the, the crowd was equally, like, just flabbergasted kind of. Here he is in his singlet and his trunks coming to the ring, not really looking all that different than he ever no. did. Like, you know, you time marches on. You can tell he's a little bit older, but, I mean, he just... He still looks like he's in shape and stuff. Gets in there for the match, and this Heath guy is kind of like, "Oh my god!" and takes a swing at Backland, and oh, he's in the chicken wing and he's tapping out to it like <laughs> nice, quick match. But my god, I, I, I just it it made my heart brim over just to think that he can, you know, they approached him to do a, a an appearance, and he said, "Well, I can do a match to a certain extent if you want." <laughs> and I think that might have just barely predated the Darren Young run as the manager. I think because the thing Maybe, Darren yeah. Young ended his tenure with WWE. But okay. yeah, I do very vividly remember that now that you brought it up. And I forgot to write that down, so I'm really glad you brought that up. And I do remember watching that and just thinking, like, good God. I'm like, <laughs> man, like, he doesn't look like he's missed a beat in terms of, like, his physique and stuff like that. He looks fantastic for a 60-something-year-old man. Like, I can't discredit the guy and the hard work he has put in to every single day of his life since he's gotten into this business. And I was also thinking about, uh, speaking of all of his hard work, I was thinking about, I think even prior to the uh, 2010 or something, he was hanging around TNA wrestling for a while there too. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think he ever had any matches, but he was often doing the, the Harvard step test at ringside, you know, up stepping up and down off the, the block or whatever. And he would do it for the entire show. Like while there's matches going on and everything <laughs> backland, he ain't stopping. He's just doing it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. That was his thing in TNA. 
and he probably never broke a sweat the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Man, is he, he's out of this world, and I'm glad, Papa's folks, that we got to sit here and talk about the career of somebody who is this great, and we did it on an account of just wanting to get together and do this. I know we had mentioned it a few weeks back, and then I yeah. really feared when I saw the trending. I was like, oh, shit. Like, just as we say his name, bring up the idea of doing this this show, all of a sudden I was fearing that the guy had passed away, and then as soon as I started reading the post, I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm like, I should have known better. Nothing kills Bob back. Yeah, he's probably going to outlive both of us. Yeah, I had imagined so too. And uh, kudos to him and the career that he's had. It's been wonderful talking about him. I think we will uh, close the chapter of the career of Bob Backlund on that note, though, Papa Spokes. Uh, before we start telling everybody where we can go and uh, reach out to us on socials or anything like that, first, I want to play you guys a quick little video. This is a sneak preview of a little show called beats and beatdowns that myself and carl carafel created and we were doing on turnbuckle studios and love wrestling previously uh season one can still be seen definitely over on turnbuckle studios youtube channel so if you want to catch up on it we're taking a a to z look at the influence of music and professional wrestling uh we got through eight episodes so far we've got a brand new season that's going to be dropping probably in the next couple few weeks here for sure but in the meantime and in between time we get a little sneak peek for what's coming up on season two of Beats and Beatdowns. That little video there was made by the man on the show there with me, Carl Carafel. Definitely check him out over at Turnbuckle Studios. He does fantastic work over there. And uh, we are big supporters of Carl. And I know he's big supporters of us here, Papa Spokes. So big shout out to him. And looking forward to uh, getting down to some business and talking about some music and wrestling again with my good pal, Carl Carafel there. Uh, we really enjoy doing Beats and Beat Downs. I've enjoyed listening to it. I, I'm all caught up on episodes now from the first uh, season, so uh, looking forward to more. We got lots in store, and a very special guest going to be joining us for that live season finale as well this season. Uh, so we uh, stay tuned to find out who that is closer to that time, but it is going to be a fantastic show. Uh, we're also, for the letter Q, just so you guys have a heads up, we couldn't really find an associated artist to go with the letter Q and professional wrestling necessarily. So Carl and I decided it's Q&A night when it comes to the letter Q. So we want you to get in your questions, whether it be uh, questions and comments about professional wrestling, about music, or about performances within pro uh, professional wrestling. We want to know what you guys know and what you want to know from the two of us. So get your questions into us on social media, in the YouTube channels here, anything like that. We're going to jot them all down. We're going to get to every single one of those questions on that episode of Beats and Beatdown. So get that in ASAP. But Papa Spokes, that brings us to an end of this episode of Ring Respect Radio, the very first Ring Respect Radio right here on OLE Podcast, our local establishment. It is an honor and a blessing to work with such wonderful people here. Uh, Papa Spokes, where can all the good people, now that we've got a big basis of fans that came over from all the other contributors here on the channel, where can they reach out to Papa Spokes? Where can they find you, follow you, and talk wrestling with you? Okay, I'm on Elon Musk's freedom platform known as Twitter, at Smokes underscore Papa. And I'm also on Twitch at Papa underscore Smokes underscore. There you go. Check out Pop Smokes over there. Uh, you can check out me at Real Bobby Munson over on Twitter. You can check us out on Instagram at Video Bros SK. Uh, you can also check us uh, check out some of my gaming and other various streams over on my personal Twitch. It's twitch.tv. Uh, forward slash video bro underscore bobby munson uh you'll also catch me in some of your streams there give me a follow over there i'll make sure to go check out what you got going on as well too uh you can also catch me doing the bravado each and every week possibly saturdays uh where i'll be talking about all things music movies and everything like that you want to talk a little bit of entertainment with me that's the time to do so and on sundays with my brunch buster brother mr chris Parrish, the one and only who man this is airing on Friday, probably prior to Chris's big open challenge he's got going on over at Love Wrestling. Chris Parrish is pissed off. 
He has turned on Bobby Sharp. He went and beat the piss out of Bobby Sharp because he's tired of getting the raw end of the stick over and love wrestling. And he snapped. He's not happy. I, I know the guy personally. I know he's not happy. And I, I fear for whoever dares to walk through that uh, that rampway and try to take on Chris Parrish because I would not want to be in the boots of the person who's going to stand across the ring from him. Well, that, yeah, that sounds very interesting. And uh, we also have some connection with the Lion Warrior, Bobby Sharp, too. So do you think he's out for revenge? Maybe Parrish better watch his back. I don't have to worry about that. Actually, Parrish beat him down so bad that Bobby Sharp is back on the injury list. He is going oh. into, into emergency surgery. Parrish beat him so far down that Bobby Sharp is on the shelf for the time being. You know that he's going to be wanting revenge on his former best friend, one of his absolute lifelong best friends in this business. Uh, I guarantee that animosity is going to carry over. And the more that Bobby has to sit there and watch Parrish's rise, I can imagine it. his blood is going to be stewing. He's going to be ready, ready, itching to get back in that ring and get that opportunity to go one-on-one -on -one with Chris Parrish down the road here. Well, good stuff, man. We got a couple of plot lines coming up for the future here too then. And, uh, I'm always interested in uh, young Parrish's career, and uh, and uh, I hope to see Parrish out in Saskatoon area for some wrestling action. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed anyway. Yeah, so am I, because then we could go party it up with him afterwards, show him a good old Saskatoon video bros party night. It'll be a blast. And speaking of uh, out in Saskatoon, if you're out in Saskatoon, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, October 29th, and you're thinking, hey, what should I do? It's Halloween weekend. I know what you should do because $15 is going to get you through the goddamn doors of the Cosmo Senior Center to watch some Prairie Pro Wrestling live wrestling action. Not only do we have that big main event, the costume battle royal for you where everybody's going to be dressed up, getting in there and dumping each other over the top ropes for the enjoyment of the fans in Saskatoon. But well, we've got the big title match. This is the one I'm excited for, Papa Smoke. It's going to be Sheik Akbar Shabazz, the longest rating very pro wrestling champion in history, taking on cutthroat Colton Kelly. It doesn't get any hotter than that. It is going to be one hell of a night. PPW presents Ring of Horrors. Yeah, good promo, Munson. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the show. You and I are going to be there in our video bro capacity as part-time security guys, full-time uh, cameramen, and uh, jack of all trades around the show, of course. And uh, I can't wait to see the boys. I can't wait to see uh, all the staff and all the all our friends that are the fans there too. The place is going to be packed, steamy and hot as it always is, and uh, loud as hell, man. I love our PPW wrestling nights. Me too. It's going to be a blast. We're looking forward to seeing you guys there. And remember to make sure to tune in Saturday afternoon to the PPW YouTube channel where you'll be able to see a brand new match. Papa Smokes and I were able to call. It is going to be a blast. This weekend is full of fun. So check it out. And thank you for joining us here on Ring Respect Radio, the Video Bros Network, also on our local establishment as well, too. It's been a blast. So for myself and Papa Smokes, until next Friday on Ring Respect Radio, take care, enjoy your day, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>